I got associated with Derailed. Um, I know the executive producer, Regina Lines, and she's been a good friend of mine forever. And she's working on this project, and she connected me with Suzanne. She put me in touch with uh, audi- she put me into the auditions, or made a reference that got me into auditions. And um, and I auditioned like you know, like the good old way of getting <laughs> jobs. <laughs> And I was delighted. I was absolutely delighted because I want to work with people that I already know and love, if I can. When you auditioned, did you audition specifically for the role of Gigi or for uh, any other role? Yeah, no, I auditioned for Gigi. She was, she was definitely, you know, you know your personality and what you're going to be good at. And uh, even by the character breakdown, just the short descriptions that they put out in casting notices. I was like, oh, that, that's my role that's the one from your work that i've seen i i couldn't picture you playing other any other role in that movie because it's the only one that has uh real <laughs> grit to it real um uh kind of yeah. spitefulness <laughs> yeah i mean i think i thrive in the switcheroo so in my opinion like a true villain isn't just a bad girl a true villain is somebody that you kind of relate to and you think is one way and then switcheroo totally the other way. So uh, you engage with a villain at some point and you you want them to succeed and then suddenly you're consumed by their world and you can't believe that they're doing this to you. So I that's what I like. I like doing the switcheroo. I, for some reason, I'm really good at playing cold and crazy as well. I think it's I think it's all in the eyes and something about your haircut too that from uh, from some of the pictures I've seen of you it's just like this this package that just perfectly works <laughs> it's just someone that's terrifying even to someone of my stature I'm just like I don't I don't really want to fuck with her <laughs> and what's funny is as soon as they say cut and I'm walking off set I'll get responses from a wardrobe hair and makeup crew members and they stop and they say you're such a nice person in real life. <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> how do you how do you turn it off so quickly? <laughs> uh, maybe it's always there. I mean, is this is true theoretically? Like, I really believe that everybody has everything in them, and it's just an expression. How you choose to express yourself mm-hmm. from day to day. Sometimes to get what you want, sometimes to feel how you want, sometimes to get done what you want to get done that day. So you're a different person when you talk to uh, the cashier at the store than you are when you talk to your boss at work. And you're a different, you give a different presentation to your yoga teacher teaching you in class as you do to your mechanic who just helped you with your electric vehicle. So everybody has like a different presentation for different people, Mm -hmm. your brother and sister, your mom and dad, everybody gets a different you. And I think everybody has all the you's that ever could exist, all the potential of humanness inside them. And that's why it's not hard for me to actually just kind of access somebody who appears to be so different than me. I'm like, we actually all have this inside of us. And I'm not, I don't express it that often mm-hmm. in real life because it doesn't get me what I need. I don't, I don't need to <laughs> be like that, but Gigi does. So what you're saying is everyone can be an actor. Yeah, we are. All of us are every day. All well, of us are every day. Man, I wish I hadn't failed at it that bad and quit Hollywood. <laughs> well, an actor who makes money. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a whole different thing. Are we, are we winning or failing now? Um, when it comes to the, the, the character of Gigi, um, if, if, if you're listening to this and you haven't watched the movie, then, uh, the movie takes place on a, uh, murder mystery train, uh, not, not exactly a tour, but an excursion. Uh, so a group of people get to watch kind of the show in this one car and you play the, um, I don't even, I don't even know what the, the cigarette, the cigarette woman or the concession woman. I don't know. Okay. Cigarette girl. Cigarette girl. There we go. 
Uh, it's been such a long time since I've heard that phrase in a movie. Um, <laughs> and it turns out that you and another character are in cahoots to rob the train. And then it kind of spirals out of control from there. We'll kind of like leave leave the rest of it out. <laughs> Because there's there's some there's yeah. some stuff that happens that that doesn't include uh, your character, so we'll let we'll let other people discover that who haven't watched it. But um, uh, when it came to shooting in that car, uh, was was the car a set itself or was it an actual box car? It was kind of hard to tell because there was so much detail when I was looking at the, the the finer details of like the walls and the and the windows and the setup. It looked like an actual box car. You know, it's a cool. It, it's a museum. Is that it? is an actual historic train museum, and we shot at night so we could use the museum because it's open during the day to the public. Mm -hmm. And that also came with limitations. Like there was, there was not a lot you could do. We couldn't injure the museum. Mm -hmm. You know, we couldn't make changes, massive changes to the museum. And it wasn't a set. It wasn't something we built. So it was constrictive. Um, camera crew light actors all had to fit in a train car <laughs> and so it's it's small you know it's it's small it's restrictive there um there were only certain things we could even do with lights because there we couldn't connect things you know uh power was an interesting i, I think they did beautifully though because we sh shine lights in through the through the train windows in some places we blacked mm -hmm. out the the windows in other places um it was fun it was fun to shoot in a museum i can imagine how uh, how annoying that was for the for the guy holding the boom mic because it doesn't look like a uh, it was a woman of... oh. a woman held the boom mic and yes it was it was like <laughs> she had a job she had a job <laughs> Uh, when you kind of have to orchestrate uh, violence and uh, like a little bit of an action scene in that in that kind of confined space, um, how <laughs> how interesting was that to film? Yeah, it was totally different. It was a confined space, and there was there were some parts that were severe action, and you know you've got a camera that, with four people standing behind it on one end, so you're trying to run past camera and there's nowhere to go around them it's, mm -hmm. it's they fill the entire other side um so i think you'll see a lot of i don't want to say camera tricks but you know it's a different way of shooting an action scene where mm -hmm. you can't necessarily get back far enough to see the whole bodies moving or to see everything in frame so you get more tight shots you get um movement in frame um and it was it was it took smart. Uh, I use a gun, and I'm good at it. <laughs> and uh, it, we wanted to be really careful, you know, that nobody actually got hurt. So we did rehearse it over and over again, and we took it half speed, and we made sure that things were going to be safe for everybody on set. Do you feel that the the confinement also added to the intensity in the final product? Well, yeah, it may, I mean, it was a true, hey, that was a 1920s era film, mm -hmm. right? So we're styled in 1920, how, how perfect to be in a museum train. So first of all, the setting was perfect. And it really took, as soon as you stepped on the train, you felt like you were transported back into history. So that was cool. And then the confines of it added to the level of fear that people could access when they were scared of the Bonnie and Clyde-ish duo. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yeah, I would say that the confines and the legitimacy of the set in that case really added to that part of the film. Uh, I think your costume was probably the most elaborate out of, uh, the period piece costumes that we saw, uh, was did you have any say in the in the actual costuming at all, or was that entirely on the costume department to give you that uh, that very specific look? Um, well, my hair was as it was, mm -hmm. and the costume department pretty much uh, they made all the decisions. I believe they had like three changes per. So, <laughs> excuse me. So if you know that's typical that you would have three options just in case one didn't look good for you mm -hmm. on the day um but the truth is 
the costume you saw me in was the first one I tried on. It fit perfectly. It looked perfectly. And you're right, it was more elaborate than the other costumes, mostly because a cigarette girl in those days, and even today, um, they're typically like uh, they are a performer. They would be in a more costumey type piece. Mm-hmm. There's something fabulous about what they're wearing. So uh, that was that was her character, and it was that piece was totally appropriate, absolutely appropriate for Gigi. Uh, the uh, the on screen presence that, uh, or the on screen chemistry that you and uh, actor Ben Hopkins uh, have to uh, have together how uh, how long did you two work on that to kind of get that uh, that Bonnie and Clyde sort of uh, uh, chemistry down? Well, it, it was easy with him um, because. <laughs> It really was because he's a great actor and he was really accessible. So um, I think he he and I both are good at being present. So we can feel what the uh, where the other person was going. So some of it we didn't plan, you know, um, it, it got it got more um, sensual when we realized that it was getting more sensual. You know, like we felt like we had domination of the car. I could feel that coming off of him. He could feel it coming off of me. We played well together. But it was fun. We didn't – we did, we spent time together before shooting, obviously, mm-hmm. and when we're not on set. But we didn't really rehearse the type of relationship we had. Instead, we kept each other away from each other because that's hmm. kind of what – if you think about it, we knew each other. Our characters knew each other the entire time. And we were we had to stay away from each other and pretend that we weren't lovers, you know? We had mm-hmm. to pretend that we weren't up to something the entire time. And so staying away from each other as actors kind of built that tension of, like, how wonderful it was going to be when we could finally reveal that we're in this together and that, and that we love it. Uh, when you saw the final cut of the film, uh, what were your thoughts on? Did you see anything that uh, that you thought, um, if you had another chance, that you would do differently, or did uh, were you were you just pleased with the overall way it came out? Oh, I think an actor has to like really surrender. There's three times the film is written, you know, mm-hmm. by the writer, by the director, actor, and then again in the editing room. So <laughs> you know that you do a lot of different takes when you're on set and the editors and the director or producer, whoever's sitting in on the, in the editing room is going to rewrite the film a third time and use whatever takes that they like. So there's a, there's a large amount of surrender I have to go through as an actor just to, you know, say that's when my job is done, my job is done being an actor like that. When I'm shooting, that's my job, but my job isn't in the editing room. So I have to trust that the other people know how to do their job and they're going to make the best movie out of it. (laughs) So when I look at the film, that's what I see. I see, oh, they chose that take. How fascinating. You know, it's not like I didn't do it a thousand different ways. Mm -hmm. I'm more fascinated by the way that they did choose and how that serves the story. Uh, When shooting in such a confined space, how how many times did you have to do a take? Oh, so, uh, I don't, I don't even, it, it wasn't consistent. There wasn't like, mm-hmm. it was, it was a, a little different than shooting process than I've had before. So we did more long takes, um, like really long takes, like many, many minutes, many, many, many minutes of takes. So mm-hmm. I previously up until this point, I'm used to, you know, shooting the scene and going back and taking a direction and shooting the scene again and going back and getting a different angle, still shooting the scene with a new angle. So it's kind of predictable. Um, This was a different, Dale worked in a different manner. So we had long shots where um, we got coaching during camera takes. So that was fun and different. And I learned a lot about a different type of shooting. I would say, you know, in one case, uh, we did one take, but it was a very long take, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. But another time, we would do five different takes. 
so it's not it's not like I can say oh how many times we shot but <laughs> how many t- how many takes we did but in the in the train um yeah we just had to we just tried to keep moving we we're shooting nights and when the sun came up it was over yeah there's no amount of blackout <laughs> that's going to it's going to cover that car so you can't see the light outside so some of the, yeah. it's like almost all windows down the side yeah um, yeah as as far as as far as an actor what do you what would you prefer going forward for the way a uh, film is shot would you prefer to have just short takes or the, the long take method do you think adds a little something that the other doesn't have um i like both ways uh mm-hmm. i like mostly i like good communication mm-hmm. so um if if uh, my preference on set is to stay healthy to stay positive um, constructive direction. Um, I just, I just like a, a positive environment. So, as, if it's long takes and it's positive, I'm good. If it's short takes, I, I'm good. Keep it positive. Keep every because it's hard. Every set you're on is hard. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if it's night shoots or day shoots. Every set is hard, and people will get stressed out. There's pressure. Um, and for the most part, I've always worked with directors and crew that, that are good at handling stress because mm-hmm. it is stressful. It can get stressful. And I think that's what separates everyone when it is stressful. How do you respond? How do you, how do you handle your stress on set? That's what makes a lot of people good at their jobs. So, but every once in a while I run into somebody who's just having that day I've had a <laughs> A different director and it was <laughs> it was hard to get through the movie because this particular director not not gail um this particular director was uh yeah he he wanted to yell a lot so we all it slowed things down too you know what i mean you slow you slow things down when you're not positive yeah you, you're going to create a toxic uh environment where everyone's just kind of not going to give their best at that point <laughs> after a certain yeah. amount of verbal abuse i think that's yeah. what, so, something that uh people that aren't in the industry don't understand um on the productions i've been on like like i think the sound guy if you're shooting outside the sound guy is the one that has it the worst because <laughs> every time there's just like that little bit of noise and he has to tell the director uh we gotta stop or we gotta redo this entire thing because you know, five planes are going by and we're losing daylight. And I just feel sorry for that poor guy that has to stop the production like every couple minutes. Seriously. And sometimes sound people, um, they they don't speak up, right? Because they don't want to mm-hmm. be a problem. And then you do a bunch of ADR. <laughs> oh, God. I, I can't imagine trying to do that if, if the stuff that I shot or the show that my wife and I were on, if we had to go back through and then try to make it sound convincing what we said on camera, we couldn't do it because we're not, we're not good actors. We're horrible actors. So we couldn't, (laughs) we couldn't record our own voices and make it sound like ourselves because we already sounded so fake on camera. (laughs) Well, you know what? ADR is one of those things like you're either good at it or you're not good at it. And, Mm -hmm. And even when you're good at it, it's like court, even a good day in court is not that great. And even a good day in ADR is still is not ideal to have <laughs> ADR in your final. Even the best ADR is still not the original audio. Right. And if you don't have a very good editor, usually you can point it out right away in a film. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, like, there's a lot of cutaways to the back of that actor's head when they're talking. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> been there, been there. Must have been a really loud day in in L.A. <laughs> yeah, or they must have shot in Burbank underneath oh. the airport. I mean, every studio in Burbank has to deal with those airplanes. <laughs> it, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Just like uh, where my office is located is right in the path of an airport, so there's a Ooh. plane going by every minute, so if I ever have to film anything outside it's just it's pointless (laughs) and people wonder why i'm always pissy when i'm sitting at my desk (laughs) yeah (laughs) just just go away i just i 
All I can do right now is edit video. I can't shoot anything. Just piss off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Keep, uh, keep your stress level. Keep your stress level. Yeah. Down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had my review recently, and yeah, and it was it wasn't very nice. <laughs> like no one wants to be around you. It's like yeah, because I can't Ooh. get anything done. <laughs> These are constructive hints. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, as far as um <laughs> your other projects that you have coming up, what is uh what is on the horizon? Oh, well, I am in Verotica, which is Glenn Danzig's um, feature film directorial debut. It's a horror film. It's based on uh, his comic book series, a mm -hmm. horror comic book series. So that premiered in Los Angeles last week to, I mean, a packed house. I've never been a part of a premiere like that. It's getting interesting reviews. But it's really <laughs> drawing so many people together, and that that's the fun part. At least for me, we had a after party, and we first of all we packed a thousand seat theater for a premiere. I've never been in a movie that had a thousand draw on its premiere night, an indie film, and oh. uh, and then the after party was filled with you know the who's who of rock, heavy metal, horror films, comic book geeks, and filmmakers. So it was a pretty cool night. It really brought people together. So I'm in that. That'll that'll be coming out. Um, I think it's coming out on Mystery Theater like this month, but it's released on video on demand on Halloween, appropriately. And I am currently writing, uh, creating with the Independent Shakespeare Company of California, a dark musical based on the life of Anita Berber. So if you don't know who she is, she is notorious um, in the 1920s in Germany. She was the zeitgeist of the times, and it was a fascinating time in the Weimar area of Berlin. So uh, very, very exciting. That goes up in November. And I produced my own live show called Pin Up Pole Show, and we have a series out called Pin Up Garage. So I'm directing that as well. Uh, can you tell me what what it's like working with uh, Glenn Danzig? Because I'm uh, I'm sure that's got to be an interesting experience. Oh well, I was kind of nervous because as I stepped on set, people kind of were 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 like, "Be careful, you know, Glenn's here. Glenn's coming around. Watch out, you know, he's gonna he's gonna change everything. He wants it his way." You know what? I, I stepped on set and I acted for him, and he was the nicest guy he was very complimentary not even just nice he came up just to me after every take and said really great work and I was like what are you guys talking about I'm not scared why are you guys running around he's this nice guy maybe he really <laughs> likes my work I don't know <laughs> but I thought he was great to work with he was fun to work with he knows what he wants um whether you agree with it or not doesn't matter. He's doing his thing, and you gotta you gotta admire that. He used um, frames from his comic book and mimicked them. Um, they were the storyboard, if you will, and he mm -hmm. mimicked the the actual comic book drawings as frame setups for his film. So that's why he was he was super particular about shots and angles and colors. And the look of the characters, um, very visual, very visual guy. It, <laughs> I'm I'm still trying to wrap my head around him just complimenting people because. <laughs> well, he complimented just, me. <laughs> well, he complimented. Maybe that was that one person per year. Maybe that was his good deed for the <laughs> for the year. It's just it, it because he has such a um, he he just has that kind of just thing that everyone kind of kind of sees him for uh kind of like the same thing with rob zombie in a way you, you think you're gonna I get this, this package mm -hmm. yeah and rob was this awesome director to work with by the way um he he wrapped us early it was a shorter day than expected he came out and spoke to the whole um cast and crew and thanked us several times during the shoot day he would stop 
production to thank us and tell us what our next shots would be. It's not up to a director to let all the actors know. Usually the first AD does that if they take the time to let everybody know. But, you know, Rob Zombie was also a joy to work with. He was he knows what he wants. He has a definite vision in mind. He's a vegan, just like me. And he was super cool, like one of my favorite directors. Uh, what, uh, what project did you work on with him? It was just a music video, mm-hmm. but it was the Foxy Foxy music video. Oh, and his, his music videos just aren't music videos. They, they, are, they yeah. are entire productions. Yes. <laughs> this one had, like, <laughs> hot rods in it and girls being bad, and it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> is, is, that, is that the favorite type of uh, character to be, someone that's being bad or someone that's kind of anti-authoritarian, very uh, uh, something where you can really kind of let loose? Uh, well, I enjoy rebellious roles. I enjoy anti-establishment roles. Um, I enjoy the switcheroo. So it's complex. It, it's not just mm-hmm. one note throughout. So I don't necessarily like being the bad girl because the bad girl doesn't go through a change. So she starts off as bad and you know exactly what she is. And by the end, she's still the bad girl and she's just one note throughout. I I mean, that's fun, but again, I go back to the villain, like there's the switcheroo, there's a complexity, Mm -hmm. a good writer writes good, good villain, villainy. So you're a whole person experiencing life and that's why people can relate to you and engage with you is because you have a complex character. You're not just bad. And sometimes, actually, sometimes I do get cast as a lot of bad girls too, Mm -hmm. but is they can be boring. I mean, it's not it's not that hard to just act like you're an addict and mm-hmm. and that you I don't know that people think bad women. I, and and here's the other thing, like it's it's all about the writing. So when you get a bad girl part in your one note throughout the whole thing, you're usually what they call addict or um bloody and then you have to start questioning the writer like uh, are you saying that addicts are bad <laughs> and and that we should you know there's there's social things that go along with that like what is slutty is it a woman having sex with as many people as she wants to like guys do it why should we judge women so then when it's a one note character i'm like why why do you even think i'm bad like this doesn't make a person bad so i like the villainy where you're complex and it goes a little deeper than that and you can see why it uh, there's empathy for villainy um you can see why a person has the motives to do the things that they do and all of us have that in us you know all of us make bad choices at certain points and we we have redeemable we have opportunity to redeem ourselves it doesn't make us a bad person because we make bad choices being an addict doesn't make you a bad person mm-hmm. sleeping with people does not make anyone a bad person you know if it's consensual that nobody's bad for having mm-hmm. consensual sex um you know it's just i i love i love analyzing writers too and what are they going for here and uh it's fascinating uh i'm fascinated by humanity this is why i'm an actor it's because i think i think the exploration of the psychology of humanity is a noble cause you know it's it's noble to get to know all these different people from and when i say get to know i mean act i'm acting Mm -hmm. all these different people i'm getting to know different people in my soul and it gives me great empathy for people that for ways of being that i haven't been in real life and that affects me how I navigate my world I'm not an actor so I can have all of your attention and be famous and get rich my goodness I'm 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 fascinated with humans and I love these relationships that we build and it's a safe place to build them I would never kill someone in real life unintentionally but my characters get to experience that, and I get to, uh, with empathy, relate to a person who might do that and what would cause them to feel that way. And it, I think it makes me a better person. Acting makes me a better person. I think um, 
on on the subject of having complex characters, I think that's that's why we've seen a decline in certain tropes in movies. Like, I can't really remember the last time we had a character in a film that was strictly there just to get comeuppance at the end. You know, like the the mean the mean girl or the stereotypical jock that gets one upped at the end of the film. I haven't really rem- I don't remember seeing that in quite some time. I think we're finally getting to the point where every character has some kind of arc. Uh, it, it, regardless if it's good or bad, they they at least have to go somewhere. I don't think like Breaking Bad would have been a good series if Walter White had just been virtuous, <laughs> or right. Jesse had just been a thug. It would have it would have fizzled out within maybe a season or two. But you have to you have to think what kind of journey are you, is the viewer going to go on? If they're not going on a journey, then what's the point? <laughs> it just becomes yeah. repetition at that point. Yeah, and they have to be able to care about every character. You mm-hmm. don't have to like every character, but you have to care what happens to them, so you keep watching. Yeah, if there's no engagement, then, you know, congratulations. You've gone back, you know, 50 years in cinema. and yeah. <laughs> just cart- Thanks for the cardboard cutouts. Where, where can I put these? What pyre can I burn them on? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and And so much of it is, like, the producing and the writing because that all starts before we even get to step on set, you know, Mm -hmm. years before we even get to step on set. So, you know, I, I only have the opportunity to do what's written. I can bring my own style to it, but if the character is not written complex, then I don't get to, I can add a little something, but there's not too much more that I can do in that story. So, uh, writers, producers, we need you and we love you. We adore you when you are pushing the boundaries and making really good art that's, you know, that's engaging and thought provoking and, and we care, we get to care about everyone on screen. We don't have to like them, (laughs) but we have to care. (laughs) Do you find that, uh, the, the writer, even though the writers don't have much to do uh, with the production by the time it's rolling, uh, the, the people involved with the creative process of filmmaking are starting to be more receptive to uh, the notes that actors have when they're trying to enrich the characters, or is it still very, here's the script, here's what I need from you, let's go do it? Uh, you asked if the writer is receptive, or, or the director, the, or... the. Everyone that's in charge of the production, if they're starting to be more receptive to input from the actors. Oh, and if it's changing the way they write next, their next yeah. piece. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, I think that change, because I acknowledge that it's changing too, uh, is kind of forced from the outside on set, but more voices from people who are on social media and in award shows and um, giving grants where the money's coming from. So as those people's minds change and want to see a difference, um, and all of us are those people on social media, you know, we're those people. Some of us are the financiers. We, some of us are the writers. Some of us are the producers. Some of us are the audience what the audience wants. So everybody's voices are changing that. And I think the change is happening. And I think it's because we're relentless and we're being relentless. We're calling it out when we see it, when it's a single note character and it has, there's no reason for that woman to be slut shamed in a movie. Mm -hmm. Um, And we call it out. I think that does affect people. The writers themselves are changing. Um, Some, and we're, we're hiring writers who match what we want to see that maybe we're there all the time, but we weren't giving jobs to. And the ones that don't agree, um, they still want to make money. So they're going to, they're going to shift as well. So it's important how actors feel, but I do feel it's, it's important offset as well to just call it out and, and keep pushing and keep it positive, you know, and keep rewarding films and people and writers and producers that are helping to make the change. Uh, my last question, uh, which is 
uh, something that I, I consider one of the most important questions is for those people that are looking to uh, get into the entertainment industry, whether it be an actor or um, whatever, it, as part of the creative process, what would be your um, advice to those people that are trying to break in? Well, that's a, that's broad. That's a yeah. lot of <laughs> Oh, let's narrow um, it down strictly to those that want to uh, be actors. Those that want to be actors. Well, I do believe that there's a difference between making your money as an actor. There's a professional actor. And then there's uh, the art of acting. Sometimes they can go hand in hand, but they don't have to go hand in hand. So even if... You're not making your money as an actor. If you have the bug, if you have the passion, if you have the single vision drive that this is what you must do, then do it. Even if it's, I'm going to say stupid, stupid little 15 <laughs> second sketch comedy pieces for Instagram. Do it. If it's low production value, like that's where you can get away with a little bit lower production value on like Instagram because nobody can watch it very big. So you don't need a big budget. A lot of people just turn their phone around and point it at them. You can do mm -hmm. sketch comedy like that. Or, you know, um, write your own part if you're an actor. Start writing your own part, your dream part. And at least in L.A., which is a different market, I've lived in New York. I've lived in Chicago. I've worked in all the markets. I've toured all over the place. Um, L.A. is definitely a different world, so not everybody has to go by this. But I feel like creating your own content as an actor is becoming really important. And it can be very fulfilling, too. So you feel like you have a voice and it's expressed and you're not just waiting, waiting, waiting for somebody else to give you a job. In the meantime, you're also creating. And uh, <laughs> I think there's something really beautiful about that. So that's my advice is if you have to do it and you want to do it, then do it and write your own roles and, and make your low budget stuff. Put it on Instagram if it's low budget and doesn't look very good um, or keep it private. You know, nobody has to see it until you feel like it's something that you want to put out there and keep at it. And if you don't have that bug, if you're doing it just because you want to be popular, you want more followers or I don't know what, some, <laughs> stop because it's really hard and you go through a roller coaster of emotions and feelings and there's, there's little security for most of us. You have to be able to flow and not know what tomorrow brings, like if you're not down with that, if you don't have the bug and the passion, then skip it. Let somebody else do it <laughs> because it can be hard. It can be hard, and you got to just love it so much that even the hard parts are worth it to you.